I want to let you know that there's only 361 days till Christmas. <laughs> now, I don't know what you think about Christmas, but uh, I, I think the thing that I enjoy most about Christmas is yeah, you know, the joy that the grandkids got out out of it, opening their presents and stuff like that. Of course, the older they get, it becomes a little harder to buy things for them. You know, Avery, no no problem, just anything will do. <laughs> and uh, Aiden, so long as military, uh, he likes that. But Ashley's a little different, you know. We we have to ask her, what, what do you want for Christmas? She said, uh, I don't want anything for Christmas. I just want to give my mother something really, really bad. <clears throat> of course, I'm thinking power tool, you know. <clears throat> I said, okay, what is it that you really, really want to give your mother? She said, uh, son-in-law. <laughs> <laughs> Should have gone with the power tool. <laughs> so I What can I say? <laughs> Out of my hands. <laughs> I would have gone to the fire tool any time. But anyway, uh, here a week or so ago, David was talking about uh, obituaries, you know, writing obituaries. And of course, for us, some of us who are <clears throat> a little more uh, mature, that becomes more of a uh, something to really seriously consider and maybe for some, some others. Of course, uh, Nancy and I, you know, we want to be prepared for all this. And, uh, you know, I, in fact, I have, uh, I own seven burial lots, seven of them. It's only two of us, seven of them. I, you know, I don't, why do I have seven? I don't know. They were available. Maybe I put a mobile home on it. I don't know. <laughs> <clears throat> But we uh, thought we ought to write a obituary, <clears throat> so uh, we did. You know, Nancy is a good writer; she's a very good writer, and uh, she wrote hers, and I read it, and it was, you know, very touching obituary. And you know me, uh, I try to keep mine to six pages, so I gave her mine six pages. You know, she didn't even read it; she had that kind of look. That you know, you know she's going to say something uh, pithy. And she said, uh, "The newspaper doesn't publish novels." And I said, "Okay." Then, then you write something. <clears throat> so she thought a minute and she wrote down something, and got in and read it and said, uh, "Ken died." I said, well, that uh, kind of gets the uh, essence of the situation, but there's a problem here. The paper has a minimum of five words, so you're going to have to redo it. So she took the paper back and uh, thought a bit and wrote something down, came back to me and said, Ken died, tractors for sale. Very practical woman, I'd say. But the fact of the matter is, unless the uh, re uh, Lord returns first, we're all going to experience physical death. Some sooner than others. It's going to be at a time uh, that we don't know. It's uncertain as of this time. I don't care what you do. You can have regular checkups. You can exercise. You can keep your cholesterol in check. You can take all the balance of nature you want to, but you're still going to die. And you just may die healthy, but you'll die. Because it says in Hebrews, the ninth chapter, verse 27, and it is appointed for men to die once, but after this, the judgment. And the question is, will we be able to say, as Paul said in 2 Timothy, the fourth chapter, verses 6 through 8, for I am already been poured out as a drink offering, and the time of my departure is at hand. 
I have fought the good fight, I have finished the race, I have kept the faith. Finally, there is laid up for me the crown of righteousness, which the Lord, the righteous judge, will give me on that day. And not to me only, but also to all who have loved his appearing. Do you love his appearing? The question that uh, may naturally arise is how uh, will we be remembered after we inevitably step off into eternity? After our passing, we will remain in the memories of others for sure through our actions, which includes our sayings and writings and, and other things perhaps, but is that all? When speaking of remembrance, what comes to mind when you hear the name of Demas? For Demas has forsaken me, having loved this present world, and has departed for the Thessalonica, 2 Timothy 4 and verse 10. Will you be remembered for as one forsaking the Christ because you have loved this present world? Will the Lord know you as one of his? What about Hymenaeus and Philetus? In 2 Timothy, uh, the second chapter, verses 14 through 19, it says in part there, uh, be diligent to present yourselves approved to God. That's what we should aim for, to present ourselves approved to God. And a worker that does not need to be ashamed because of what is uh, disclosed on that final day. And the way to do it is rightly dividing the word of truth. It says, but shun profane and idle babblings, for they will increase to more ungodliness. And their message was spread like a cancer. Hymenaeus and Philetus are of this sort, who have strayed concerning the truth. And it goes on to say they overthrow the faith of some. Nevertheless, the solid foundation of God stands having this seal. The Lord knows who are his. And let everyone who names the name of Christ depart from iniquity. Will you be known as overthrowing the faith of some? Will God know you as his? Those of you desiring to live godly in Christ Jesus, will you be remembered for your patience and perseverance while suffering persecution in the service of the uh, Master? Paul says that all who desire to live godly in Christ will suffer persecution, 2 Timothy 3, verse 12. Do you remember what was said of the perseverance of Job? Indeed, we count them blessed who endure. You have heard of the perseverance of Job and see the, seen the in, end intended by the Lord, that the Lord is very compassionate and merciful, James 5, verse 11. What do you remember about Lot's wife? In Luke, the 17th chapter, verse 32, he reminds us, remember Lot's wife. Well, what about Lot's wife? In Genesis, the 19th chapter, verse 26, but his wife looked back behind him, and she became a pillar of salt. Will you be remembered for looking back when you should press towards the goal for the prize of the upward call of God in Christ Jesus? Philippians 3.14 We remember faithful Abel, of whom the writer of Hebrews com commented in Hebrews 11, chapter verse 4. By faith, Abel offered to God a more excellent sacrifice than Cain, through which he obtained witness that he was righteous, God testifying of his gifts. And through it, he, being dead, still speaks. He left for us an example of righteous actions, even though he lost his life as a result. Indeed, the entire 11th chapter of Hebrews is a memory lane of those worthies whom we remember and should emulate. Their memory will last on into eternity. These positive and negative examples are, are examples to remember for their attributes that we should either emulate or avoid. There are many other positive and negative examples recorded in the divine record for all eternity. What a greater example could we have than Jesus? The lesson that these examples teach us is that how we live in the flesh will determine how we are regarded or why we live and how we are remembered after we die. Although our deeds will outlive us, and just as in the case of Abel, will speak to those still living, 
I would like to focus on the one whose remembrance of us will really matter. In Revelation, the 14th chapter, verses 6 through 13, Then I saw another angel flying in the midst of heaven, having the everlasting gospel to preach to those who dwell on the earth. And at this point, he's talking about the, uh, the unfaithful. To every nation, tribe, tongue, and people, saying with a loud voice, Fear God and give glory to Him, for the hour of His judgment has come, and worship Him who made heaven and earth, the sea, and springs of water. Then another angel followed, saying, Babylon is fallen, is fallen, that great city, because she has made all nations drink of the wine of the wrath of her fornication. Then a third angel followed them, saying with a loud voice, If anyone worships the beast in his image and receives the mark on his forehead or on his hand, he himself shall also drink of the wine of the wrath of God, which is poured out in full strength into the cup of his indignation. He shall be tormented with fire and brimstone in the presence of the holy angels and in the presence of the Lamb. And the smoke of their torment ascends forever and ever, and they have no rest day or night, who worship the beast and his image, and whoever receives the mark of his name. In verse 12 it says, Here is the patient of the saints. Here are those who keep the commandments of God and the faith of Jesus. Then I heard a voice from heaven saying to me, Write, Blessed are the dead who die in the Lord from now on. Yes, says the Spirit, they, that they may rest from their labors and their works follow them. The time of the writing of the book of Revelation by the pen of John the Apostle was one of severe persecution. The saints needed encouragement and comfort to remain steadfast, immovable, always abounding in the work of the Lord, knowing that your labor is not in vain the Lord, 1 Corinthians 15:58. This section of Revelation, indeed, the whole book, provides that encouragement and comfort. The other angel, remember, the, you know, an angel's a messenger. The other angel in verse 6 was positioned such that he could be seen and heard throughout the earth, where the message is to those who dwell on the earth, to every nation, tribe, tongue, and people. Those redeemed by the blood of Christ also come out of every tribe and tongue, and people and nation, Revelation 5th chapter, verse 9. Therefore, the everlasting gospel, the gospel that saves, was preached to every creature under heaven. Colossians 1.23, Galatians uh, 1.8, Romans 1, 16, 17, and so forth. <clears throat> so, we know that those who are the subject of the above passage in Revelation have heard or have had the opportunity to hear the soul-saving gospel. What people do with the gospel will determine their judgment both in a temporal sense, and that's here, maybe, maybe individually or uh, collectively, but uh, it determine that judgment there. And certainly uh, individually in a spiritual sense, they will be judged spiritually. We know the Lord will remember us in eternity. But exactly what will he remember? As it says in 2 Corinthians 5.10, For we all must appear before the judgment seat of Christ, that each one may receive the things done in the body according to what he has done, whether good or bad. Indeed, Jesus testified in Revelation 22nd chapter, verse 12, And behold, I am coming quickly, and my reward is with me, to give to everyone according to his work. Now, what is to define the character of that which one has done, whether it is good or bad? In John 12, 48, we read, He who rejects me and does not receive my words has one that judges him. The word that I have spoken will judge him in the last day. When the rich man and Lazarus, the beggar, both died, the rich man was in torment, and the scripture says torments, plural, while Lazarus was in Abraham's bosom. Not wanting his brothers to suffer the same fate as he, the rich man, implored Abraham to send Lazarus back to warn them. But Abraham refused, saying, if they would not obey Moses and the prophets, that is, the written word at that time, then they would not believe one sent from the dead. 
it would be accurate to say that Lazarus received and obeyed the words of Jesus and therefore was one of the blessed dead. Whereas the rich man did not receive the words of Jesus, was judged by the words of Jesus, and therefore was not one of the blessed dead. All the concerns of life, this life, all its tribulations, will be put to rest when we put off this tabernacle of flesh. Paul did not say it was better to depart and be with Christ. He said it was far better. Philippians 1.23 There is nothing this life and flesh can offer that can come close, can come even close to the dying in the Lord and resting from our labors. The previous quote from Revelation chapter 14 says that our works will follow us as one of the blessed dead. And it may be also the same as was the case with Abel, who still speaks to us by his words. Of course, his works followed him into eternity, but his example still teaches us. There is no doubt that our works in this present life will have an influence on those now living and yet to be born for good or evil, even after our demise. What will your legacy be? In the Revelation passage, however, our works do not stay here. They will follow us into eternity. For what purpose? Obviously, it is so we can be remembered. The previously cited passage in 2 Corinthians 5.10 and John 12.48 makes clear that our works considered in the light of the eternal word will be how we will be remembered. This is further emphasized in my Revelation, in Revelation 20th chapter, verses 11 through 15, which reads, Then I saw a great white throne of him who sat on it, from whose face the earth and the heaven fled away. And there was found no place for them. And I saw the dead, small and great, standing before God. And books were opened. And another book was opened, which is the book of life. And the dead were judged according to their works by the things which were written in the books. The sea gave up the dead who were in it, and death and Hades delivered up the dead who were in them. And they were judged, each according to his works. Then death and Hades were cast in the lake of fire. This is the second death. And anyone not found written in the book of life was cast into the lake of fire. Now, I don't know about you, but I want my name to be written in the book of life, and I do not want to be cast into the lake of fire. As it says in Revelation 14, chapter, verse 12, those whose name is written in the book of life will be those who keep the commandments of God and the faith of Jesus. I want to hear the same words that the five-talent man and the two-talent man heard. His Lord said to him, Well done, good and faithful servant. You are faithful over a few things, and I will make you ruler over many things. Enter into the joy of your Lord. Matthew, the 25th chapter, verse 12. But who are those uh, the, who die in the Lord? Who are the blessed dead? These are important questions for each of us to consider and ones that must be answered. In Revelation 14, chapter, verses 1 through 5, we read, Then I looked, and behold, a lamb standing on Mount Zion, and with him 144,000, having his father's name written on their foreheads. And I heard a voice from heaven like the voice of many waters and like the voice of loud thunder. And I heard the sound of harpists playing their harps, and they sang, as it were, a new song before the throne, before the Lord, four living creatures. And the elders and no one could learn that song except the 144,000 who were redeemed from the earth. These are the ones who were not defiled with women, for they are virgins. They are the ones who follow the Lamb wherever He goes. And they were redeemed from among men, being fruit the first fruits to God and to the Lamb. And in their mouth was found no deceit, for they are without fault before the, before the throne of God. Now the 144,000 is, you don't take that as a literal number, it's symbolic of those uh, who are redeemed. Those unfaithful in the Old Testament are said to have committed spiritual adultery. We uh, went through this on the Minor Prophets. In comparison, the virgins spoken of here are, are not, have not committed spiritual adultery. Only they could learn 
redemption's sweet song. There are five characteristics set forth here to describe the 144,000. First, they were purchased out of the earth, that is, purchased by the blood of the Lamb, Revelations 5, verse 9 and following. They are the redeemed. Second, they were not defiled with women, that is, they were spiritually chaste. Third, they follow the Lamb wherever He goes. Each disciple is called upon to take up His cross and follow Him, Matthew 16, verse 24. Fourth, they were redeemed from among men, being first fruits. Under the mosaical system, the first uh, fruits of the harvest were offered to God. Uh, the 144,000 were symbolically the first fruits of the spiritual Israel who had been purchased by the blood of the Lamb. Now, if they are the first fruits, then later fruits are to follow. And five, finally, in their mouth was found no deceit, for they are without fault before the throne of God. They neither held nor taught any spiritual falsehood. They were without spiritual or moral blemish. They fulfilled the divine standard for the church, as Paul wrote in Ephesians 5, chapter, verse 27 about the blessed dead, that he might present her to himself a glorious church, not having spot or wrinkle or any such thing, but that she should be holy and without blemish. In Romans, the sixth chapter, verses three and four, we read of the new life in Christ. Or do you not know that as many of us as were baptized into Christ were baptized into his death? Therefore, we were buried with him through baptism into death that just as Christ was raised from the dead by the glory of the Father, so even so we should walk in newness of life. Here is one who died in the Lord, that is, he has died to sin and walks in newness of life. By being buried into his death, he is now in Christ, where he has found every spiritual blessing, including but not limited to salvation. Ephesians first chapter verse 3. Now don't you want to be included with the one who walks in newness of life. Paul further writes in Romans 6, chapter verses 5 and 6, For if we have been united together in the likeness of his death, certainly we also shall be in the likeness of his resurrection, knowing this, that our old man was crucified with him, that the body of sin might be done away with, that we should no longer be slaves of sin. Jesus is recorded in Mark 16, chapter verse 15 and 16, saying, and he said to them, Go into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature. He who believes and is baptized will be saved, but he who does not believe will be condemned. Furthermore, he says in Matthew the 28th chapter, verses 19 and 20, there, Go therefore and make disciples of all the nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all things that I have commanded you. And lo, I am with you even, always, even to the end of the age. The Apostle Peter commended, commanded those believing Gentiles to be baptized in the name of the Lord, Acts 10, verse 48. In Revelation, the 22nd chapter, verse 14, we read the following. Blessed are those who do his commandments, that they may have the right to the tree of life and may enter into the gates of the city. If one not, does not do his commandments, he does not die in the Lord, nor has a right to the tree of life. He may not enter through the gate into the heavenly city. Baptizing them, that uh, those that are qualified to be baptized, is as much a command as go and preach. Of course, baptism and walking in newness of life are predicated on hearing the gospel, Mark 16, 15, and Romans 10, 14, and 17. Believing, Mark 16, 16, and John 8, 24, and Hebrews 11, 6. Uh, repenting, Luke 13 and 3, Acts 2:38 and 17 and 30, and confessing, Matthew 10:32, 33, Acts 8, uh, 36 to 37, Romans 10:10. 10, 10. Then one is qualified to be buried in the waters of baptism and therefore washed by the blood of, of uh, Christ. This is how to get into Christ. Only those in Christ, that is, a child of God, can lay up treasures in heaven. The treasures we lay up in heaven are safe. 
And God will not forget us or our works. As the revelation of the Christ has recorded in chapter 2, verse 10, do not fear any of those with whom, with you, which you are about to suffer. Indeed, the devil is about to throw some of you into prison that you may be tested, and you will have tribulation ten days. Be faithful unto death, and I like the uh, King James and ASV better, unto death, even if it causes you to die. Be faithful until death, and I will give you a crown of life. This is how to receive the crown of life. Be faithful, even if you must die for it. Then you will be one of the blessed dead who died in the Lord. There in the abode of the blessed dead, God will wipe away every tear from their eyes, and there shall be no more death, nor sorrow, nor crying. There shall be no more pain, for the former things have passed away. Revelation 21st chapter verse 4. And I think at this time, in the words of the psalmist and the 101st psalm are worthy of uh, notation. It says, I will sing of mercy and justice to you, O Lord. I will sing praises. I will behave wisely in a perfect way. Oh, when will you come to me? I will walk within my house with a perfect heart. I will set nothing wicked before my eyes. I hate the work, <clears throat> the work of those who fall away. It shall not cling to me. A perverse heart shall depart from me. I will not know wickedness. Whoever secretly slanders his neighbor, him I will destroy. The one who has a haughty look and a proud heart, him I will not endure. My eyes shall be on the faith of the land, that they may dwell with me. He who walks in a perfect way, he shall serve me. He who works deceit shall not dwell my, within my house. He who tells lies shall not continue in my presence. Early I will destroy all the wicked of the land, that I may cut off the evildoers from the city of the Lord. I think it would uh, be well for us to know this psalm quite well. If this day you are not a child of God, and, and the only means to become one is, as I heretofore have enumerated, then death is grim and foreboding. We bid you before eternity's door of blessedness is shut, that you lay hold of that glory that is to be in the mansion sublime by responding to the gospel's call as we stand and sing.